Uh, before we get into the YDNA, I want to give you an overview. Philip, the brilliant student that he is, jumps right into the analysis of YDNA. I want to give you a background because we're a, a basic level of what DNA we're looking at. So here's basically what we're talking about with the chromosomes and the DNA. What we're looking at is the sex gene of the Y DNA. But there are three types of DNA tests. And we talked about this early before the meeting started. Autosomal, which looks at your entire uh, chromosome history. Then you have the Y DNA, which is passed down through men. And then you have the mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down through women. I mentioned before we started that I found out that my mitochondrial DNA from the women of my family made me extremely Irish. So that was very interesting. And then we have the Y DNA. And one of the, the largest testing services is Family Tree DNA. And I, I took over the uh, Family Tree DNA Forbes group about a year and a half, two years ago, which was kind of dormant. And so we now have 209 members of that. And we have both of the other admins with us. And Philip's going to give us a great overview of what that means. But to give you a perspective based on just Y DNA, not MTM DNA or autosomal, here's the, the broad group of the Forbes haplogroup, which is generally our M269. And that is, in fact, uh, the group haplogroup of Malcolm Lord Forbes, the chief of Clan Forbes. However, we have others. Mine, for example, is IM253. So that's another area we want to look at as well. But right today, we're going to focus on the RM269. So we have two other managers or administrators of our group. And oh, here's Malcolm Forbes. He has submitted a test. He hasn't done the big Y yet but I'll be talking about that at the end of the presentation. But, but Malcolm is a part of this group. We're very fortunate that we have a clan chief which is really engaged with the clan, with the society. A lot of clan chiefs prefer not to provide their DNA. I don't know what they're scared of. <laughs> you know, some think that perhaps someone will prove that they shouldn't be chief, but that's, of course, the decision by the Lord Lion that I mentioned. But again, we're very fortunate that Malcolm Lord Forbes has contributed his DNA, in fact, twice. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that when we talk about the project. So the two other admins are Beth Carlson and Philip Stead. Uh, before we go to Philip, Beth, do you have some comments you want to offer about your work in DNA and with, um, with genealogy? Well, hello. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be part of the Clan Forbes um, DNA committee here. Um, I'm not, my background is in traditional genealogy. I'm a DAR trained genealogist and could probably answer more questions about the other segment of your program today than I can the segment that I'm on. But um, I'm here to learn as much as I can and to help you all as much as I can. Um, and I'm thrilled that um, I wasn't able, wasn't supposed to speak on all of Phil's slides because I wasn't prepared to do so. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm happy to help anyone I can. Beth, you provide a really critical link between genealogy and DNA. So you, you have a very important role. Uh, Phil has done an amazing work. Uh, he's been responding to questions from YDNA and some of the group. And he's done a great presentation, which uh, I have been in its entirety, Phil. <laughs> so you'll be happy to know that. So at the end of Phil's presentation, Phil's, Phil's sorry, presentation, uh, we'll have any questions for him, uh, and I can stop talking. So, Philip, without any further ado, you are on, and we'll go right to your presentation. You're on, brother. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. And obviously, I'm Philip. Um, obviously, I've got a North English, sometimes sounds Scottish because we're very close to the border here, um, accent. So, hopefully, you can understand me okay. I'll try and tone it down as much as I can. Um, but yeah, um, I'm now in my second year of a master's degree um, at Strathclyde University. And I specialize in um, DNA analysis. 
and I'm hoping to then progress on to a PhD um, in that field. So it's, uh, it's an honour to be involved in uh, the Clan Forbes project and um, let's hope uh, I can help you all progress and, and understand. So the early origins of um, the Haplo group, that is R1A, it should be R1B, that's a mistake. Okay. Um, it basically happened on the Russian steppes. Um, and we're talking around about the corded, uh, the corded way time period. And it expanded into the West um, with the Bell bigger people. Um, and if we just kind of, of move on, that would be great. So this is kind of a frequency distribution map. And this shows um, the frequency of the R1B haplotype throughout Europe. Um, and obviously it's more concentrated in the West. So obviously it just happens by random instance how something gets so frequent. Um, in R1B case, um, obviously the R1B was very, very successful in its migration across from the East to the West. Okay, so, so basically, um, what you need to see here is obviously the, what we call SMPs, okay, or SNPs, okay? So a SNP is basically a genetic marker, and these are passed on by each male to the next generation. And every 100 to 150 years or so, there is a new SNP which actually um, mutates and it gets passed on to the next kind of offspring, male offspring, and so forth. So we can basically create a family tree. This is basically a family tree just using genetics and Y DNA mutations. Um, obviously, I'm focusing a lot on M269 because that is the, well, most frequent in the fourth project, but also within um, the British Isles. And obviously, the majority of you lot have got British Isles ancestry. Okay, so the main haplotype is, or the haplogroup is R1B, and then we can identify M269. Now this happened, okay, not long after the Neolithic. Okay, so it's a very, very old SNP, okay. And it's probably something around about, I don't know, 8,000 years old. So if you've got that SNP, you are all related within the last 8,000 years. Now, remember, your Y DNA is only a tiny proportion, okay, of your actual overall DNA. So the amount of ancestors that you might have, that's M269 might be quite a lot. Personally, my haplotype is R1A, okay. Um, I'm not R1B, but my paternal grandfather is actually um, M269, but he's much further down as well because we've tested further downstream. So basically, if you follow down to the next mutation, L23, and then you keep going, and then it brings you to P312. At this stage, um, you can see several big branches coming off. And um, obviously, P312, also known as S116, depending on who you test with, um, had lots of offspring, very, 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 you know, high status individual and um, managed to have a lot, lot of offspring that then went off to have lots of offspring as well. Um, if you scroll further down, follow down, you'll see L21. Sorry. L21, that's fine, yeah. L21, yeah, we're fine with that, but yeah, to go to L21. Okay. So L21 is um, one of the SNPs that is quite common within the group, okay? And this came to Britain during the Bronze Age. So there was a big migration of the Bell Beaker people um, and that included L21 and DF27, um, which we'll come on to later. Um, and it basically is concentrated, you know, up in the north of France and obviously Great Britain. And then you can see it also uh, in parts of Scandinavia. Um, now, they basically invaded these areas and they replaced about 90% of the Neolithic population. Um, you've got to remember the Neolithic in, in, in Britain at the time, um, they were building Stonehenge, but they were using stone tools. Okay. 
these bell beaker people came with new technology, Bronze Age technology, okay? And um, they came with weapons that were far superior. They had domesticated the horse, they invented the wheel. Um, they were far more technologically advanced. And basically um, only 10% of the Neolithic survives in today's population um, within um, Britain. So basically the bigger bell people um, killed off 90%. So we could trace that in the genetics. And I know Bart um, mentioned earlier about autosomal DNA. Um, we can still see that 10% of traces of that Neolithic DNA in us. Um, but obviously the 90%, it comes from the steps. Okay. And so we had basically our earlier origins before the Bronze Age around the Russian steppes and the migration from east to west in, okay. Um, the Neolithic tend to be I2, and you can see that on the ancient DNA throughout the, um, those that they've tested in Britain. And L21 um, is one of the main branches that we would find in Bigger Bell within Britain. So it's been here for about four and a half thousand years in Britain. And obviously it's getting to the States through obviously the migration of, you know, your, your Irish, your Scots, your English. Okay. Now we go down, if we go back, Bart, sorry, I'll just explain. Um, yep. So DF13 is the next kind of mutation down and it splits off. Um, and you can see all these different descendants of DF13. Um, and you've got obviously a lot that are associated with Scotland, Ireland. L21 is like really, really frequent in Ireland, um, Wales, and in Scotland. It still is quite frequent in, um, in England, but not as much. Um, and that's because of obviously the more Germanic um, invasions later on from Anglo-Saxon Jude. Um, and also we've got obviously the Norse as well. So happy to move on now. So when we get to this branch further down, okay, it's just another mutation and it takes us very close to um, what the, the chiefly line's going to be or most likely to be based on my analysis. So there's lots of different kind of um, branching out now. And as you get further and further from the root, there's obviously going to be more and more descendants. So you can see it branching out and branching out. Um, and that's why it's really important to test for SNPs rather than um, the general STR marker. So when you see a DNA test through family tree DNA, it's often people start off with a, an STR marker test. So like the Y37 does 37 STR markers, and then you can upgrade to Y67. And that's obviously 67 STR markers and then um, 111. It's SNPs that are the most reliable because um, mutations, once it happens, it gets passed on to the next generation. With STR markers, that are unreliable because they can mutate backwards and forwards. It's very random. Um, it can, it's really, really confusing to explain, but it, certain markers could match up and you could still be a totally different haplotype group in terms of the SNP. So I've had situations where I've had somebody that's mo uh, matching it a genetic distance of four or five at 67 STR markers, and they've turned out to be pretty distantly re related. So talking within the last 2000 years. So people are getting all excited and saying, yes, oh, I'm a genetic distance of four, that must be quite close. Well, in fact, in fact, when we've looked at the SNPs, that pretty distant. So we've got to try and encourage the uptake of SNP testing rather than STR. STR is quite good, but we need more data on the SNPs. Okay. Um, so the chief, the chief um, haplotype group for Clan Forbes, it is looking highly likely that they, they belong to DF27. Okay. Um, DF27, um, is really concentrated on the current kind of um, frequency table in Iberia. Um, so I've highlighted here L617, that is looking the most likely branch off for um, Lord Forbes. And obviously um, 
the more data we get, the more we'll be able to confirm that. And obviously when we get his DNA sequenced, um, we'll see lots of branches happening um, below L617. Okay, Max, it's all good. So yeah, if you have a look at the frequency map, um, obviously Iberia and obviously France. Now, these would have came across with the belt that would have been in the bell bigger people um, that came across from the Russian steppes. Now, it could be a migration from early Celtic people into the British Isles, okay, or it could have came with the Normans, okay. Now, based on the fact that uh, Lord Forbes is aristocracy, um, it's most likely going to be Norman, um, how, the, how it actually got itself to Britain. When we get more data, we'll be able to narrow that down a bit further. Um, but obviously, that's that's the way it kind of looks at the minute. There's a lot of DF27, and that's still going to be about 4,200 years back. That, that's how that snip is. Okay, so ready to move on. So if you have a look here, this is kind of um, a predicted map. Um, obviously, gets you around the steps at L23, and then it moves. Um, from east to west and then into Britain. That is the kind of the pathway. The current SNP is basically um, what is proposed. And this is off, I think it, it could be Robert or Bob. Um, he's done the big Y. He's got a very close STR signature at um, 111 markers to Lord Forbes. So it's highly likely that Lord Forbes is going to be um, also positive for uh, BY61239. They just give the, these SNPs numbers. It's just to, to basically identify them. And obviously that happened around about kind of the Iron Age, okay? Or just after the Iron Age, that SNP happened. Um, we'll get more data when we'll, we'll test more within that cluster. Right, hold on, ready to go on. So yeah, I basically um, put it into the, uh, the, the SNP tracker. And it's looking around about being um, 1,750 years old, okay? Um, there's two other matches in England with this SNP. Um, obviously, we'll expect that to deviate. It will become more Scottish um, centralised when we get other branches below this SNP. So it's just a case of getting more tested. Um, I think um, Bob has, when I last looked, eight private variants, okay? So that's private SNPs, and they'll branch out and create new branches depending on where he matches with other people. Um, and I'm predicting that it's going to be around about 1,000, maybe 800 years that he's split from Malcolm, okay? So we'll have to wait and see what happens when we get that data, okay? So, Obviously, one thing to remember, if you don't test for positive for DF27 or any of the associated SNPs that follow um, on from the Chiefly line, um, that doesn't mean you're not a member of Clan Forbes. What that means is you're just not descended from the, di the direct paternal line. Um, and there's lots of different reasons why that can happen. Um, a lot of the time, um, it could be that you, your ancestor was part of Clan Thorpes, um, paid his allegiance to, to the um, Thorpe chief at the time. Um, and they often took on the surname of the chief, okay? Um, it could have been a case that you might descend from a female of the chiefly line, then married. And because she was kind of, you know, the, the, the senior rank and person, the husband took Forbes as the, as the surname, but the descendants would then carry the Y DNA of, um, whatever surname it was previously, okay? There's lots of other different um, reasons that can happen. Sometimes a non-paternal event can happen, okay? Sometimes we can't explain when that happens. Um, that situation's happened with my own paternal line where it looks like my surname really is instead, it should be um, most likely uh, Levitt, okay? Based on the Y DNA, and that probably happened somewhere around about the 1600s, okay? Um, Maybe it's all the way back to the point when um, surnames were introduced. 
So you've got to remember that surnames in Britain were only starting to be introduced after 1066 and mainly between 12 and 1400. Um, part of a way of keeping track of people so that they can tax them. Um, so they started introducing surnames. So a lot of people, um, you know, might have been related and just took on a surname because of their occupation, for example. So if they were a smith, a blacksmith, they might have had blacksmith or smith. Okay, but his brother might have been an archer and took on archer as the surname. Okay, sometimes they took on place names as well. So just because you don't share a, um, a surname with somebody, it might be because, and you might be related, it might be because that circumstances were different. Okay. So what do we really need to do to advance the research? Um, well, obviously, um, if people can start testing SNPs and if you're wanting an, a very kind of economical way of doing it, I've, I've tried going down the individual SNP and just randomly picking ones that I'm thinking, yeah, it's going to be this, it's going to be this, and wasted a lot of money because it's like $40 each time. Um, it soon mounts up. Um, upgrading to the big Y700 is the best way forward. It'll save you money in the long run um, unless you've got a really close um, STR signature with somebody that's already done the big Y700 and then we can kind of accu accurately predict and say yeah you could definitely go in and measure this uh, test for this SNP it's highly likely you're going to be positive for it um, obviously the big Y is far more um, reliable and it will sequence all the re readable regions of the Y chromosome um, and give you these SNPs okay um, which are just mutations on the Y chromosome, single mutations. And it will also give you private ones. And that kind of gives you, um, you know, an investment in the future because as matches come, come up and you start matching people at private SNPs, you start creating a new branch and the tree grows. Okay. Um, so if you don't get any immediate matches in the future, you will. Mine's constantly changing. My um, terminal SNP is constantly changing um, to basically um, when somebody matches a new branch forms and then we get a new um, SNP identification, which identifies me and this individual that matches with me. Um, these are much more accurate, like I explained earlier. STR markers are very, very uh, prone to mutating very, very unstable. They can mutate forwards, they can mutate back, um, and it causes a lot of confusion. And it sometimes can make somebody appear close in relationship to you when in fact they're not. Um, and you know, the, the time, the most recent common ancestor could be way, way back. So with the SNPs, they're very, very reliable, very, very stable. And obviously that's the way to go if we want to progress the, the, um, the project is getting people to uptake the big Y700 eventually. And you can do that in stages as well. So you can go in at an entry level with, you know, uh, Y37 and then just upgrade as time goes on. And I always wait for the sales may and then basically upgrade as we go. Um, and like I said, it's an investment for the future. So any questions? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to know if he could explain the autosomal uh, DNA testing a little yep. bit. So, so basically this is kind of, um, you, you get 50-50% from both parents, okay, of your autosomal DNA. Um, during when you're conceived, that mixes and combines and it, and it can recombine. And because of a recombination process that takes place, um, we can only trace back between three and 400 years. So matches can only happen in that time period. You, you're going to be pushing it, getting um, matches with somebody that you share a common ancestor with, um, you know, before 1650. Um, and only about, I'd say less than 50% of your distant cousins will match you on that test. So don't worry if you've got a match on a like you match on a tree and then you both DNA test and say, well, we don't match on the DNA. That can happen. Okay. And um, the probability of a match happening basically um, on the DNA test um, gets kind of reduced as we go further away in time. So eventually when you get to 1650, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to match on a DNA test. But if you match within, you know, 
two, three hundred years, it's highly likely that it's going to show up. Um, and okay, so. I've done the autosomal. Yeah. Yep. Basically, on the on the mother's sides up. Yeah. Even on my father's mother's part, <laughs> it it goes back quite a way, but I'm not getting any of the Forbes's. Yeah. Which so, is what I'm trying to tra trace. Yeah. So yeah, again, it it just depends on when your Forbes ancestor is in your tree. So what date roughly is it? Your first Forbes ancestor? My Do you know father. What? All right. So yeah. So basically, um, it could be that you know there's just none of your branch tested yet. Um, I'd have to have a look as well. To be honest, are you on, are you on the project? Uh, not yet, but I. I'd like to get on it. <laughs> who, have you, who have you tested with? Is uh, it Heritage. Right. And 23andMe and Ancestry, all three of them. Right. Because you should be able to upload um, your raw data to Family Tree DNA and you should be able to do a free transfer for that. Okay. And then you might be, then you be able to join the project and then we can see who you might match on FTDNA. But um, it, yeah, it, it's it's it, there's lots of limitations with autosomal DNA, but lots of limitations, um, and a lot of it's down to that uh, recombination process. So sometimes you just don't match your cousins genetically um, because it's it's it gets diluted each time. Um, a perfect example to explain it a little bit further. I've tested um, both my parents and both my wife's parents, and also my daughter did it for a little project study. Um, and she inherited 32% of my dad and only 18% of my mother. And then 26% of um, my father-in-law and 24% of my mother-in-law. Now, just imagine another couple of generations. Okay. If, it, if the trend continues that more of my dad's genetics gets passed on to her offspring or her descendants, my mom's trace could basically be totally gone and eventually all of them will be gone so in 400 years time an autosomal dna test um wouldn't match any of us so you've got about a, so you've got about a 400 year threshold that you can look at great i have one more quick question yep. i have a hair wreath that my great grandmother made and it's got my my grandfather my great grandfather uh on the forbes side as well as the carson side which was her <laughs> side can you get DNA off of a 150-year-old hair? <laughs> so, yes, you can. However, how much has it been handled? How much is the contamination going mm -hmm. on with other people's DNA? Um, that's the problem. Because I want to do a study. I know that there's a bit of Bonnie Prince Charlie's hair up um, in a castle up in Scotland. But how many people have touched it? And it, if it's contaminated, I'm not going to get a reliable kind of result. So, um it's possible, yes, but whose DNA are you going to get? Are you going to get that actual ancestors? Are you going to get the people that handled it? Yeah, That's handled the problem. It. Yeah. So, great. great question. Well, thank you very much. Stephanie, no you're up. My question is first of all, I'm so grateful that my brother was finally grouped. Uh, we, we had his DNA done a long time ago. And so I'm so grateful yep. that this has come back to life. <laughs> thank you for you know, working on it. Um, my question is, is the significance of the groups, does that have to do with this, the SNPs? So at the minute, there's not very many people have tested SNPs within the project. So I've been looking at STR signatures and they're not very reliable. I've tried to do my best based on the data that I've got to group people. So it's still a work in progress and people might move groups. So it's just, you know, it, we need more data basically for it to be a lot more reliable and the validity will go up as more people test. So, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best to try and group based on what I can see, but what I can see can't be 100% validated because SNPs are more important than STR markers. And okay, stay well. Tuned, stay tuned for after Alex's presentation. We'll talk about the Clan Forbes genealogy project, which you may find very interesting. Okay. Foreshadowing. Any other questions from anyone? Yes, Jay. I see you, Jay.
Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, here in where we where we are in West Tennessee, my dad here is the oldest uh, living uh, Forbes from our line. Uh, where and how would we get him tested to see where we match up? So um, I would order a family tree DNA kit um, and then obviously join the, the Forbes DNA project. Um, we, we've done the Ancestry.com. Okay, or so um, I can get, um, I can get um, look by looking at the raw data on Ancestry, a lot of people don't know this, um, it's mainly autosomal DNA, but when a, a male sends in a sample, um, they test for about a thousand SNPs. And I can get a rough idea of what your DNA haplotype group is. Um, it would require you to download the raw DNA data um, and email that to me. And then I'll be able to uh, do an analysis on it and then get you a haplotype group. Um, it will be old though, because they don't test into any detail into the Y chromosome. Um, so basically, I can get the level. Say if you were L21, I'd be able to tell you if you were L21. I'm not sure if DF27 um, is on there. It might be. They might test for that. Um, so, yeah, I can get a rough haplotype group for you. And then, um, obviously, that might give you, you know, if, if it comes up DF27, um, that might encourage you to kind of go on and see if you've got the, the Forbes um, chiefly line Y DNA as well. So yeah, um, if you're interested, just email oh, yeah. me uh, raw data. Do you know how to do it? If you send me an email, um, and my email's on the um, the Forbes Y DNA project, um, I can send you instructions on how you download the raw raw data. Actually, Philip, I've been nagging you to write blogs. I think that'd be a wonderful blog you could write about how you can transfer yep. your DNA information to Ancestry into Family Tree DNA and then how you can yep. join the project. Isn't that a yeah. great idea? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I did do a couple of blogs and I posted them on the... Um... That's right. And I had to transfer them over to the website because right. if you're not on Family Tree DNA or not part of the Forbes group, you can't see that. Won't so see I'll it, go yeah. back on and I will do that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. brilliant. Thank you. If there's no other okay. questions, uh, we can go on. Yes, other question, Jay. Just email you, correct, Philip? We, we can just email you? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah I will provide the email. email address. Okay, all right. Uh, as follow-up to this, I'll provide email address to y'all and all the materials. I do want to announce uh, the new uh, genealogy project of the Clan Forbes Society. I'm sorry, I'm giving you vertigo. This is the project that we've been discussing uh, with the board. It has several components. First off, Origins of the Chief. You've seen a lot of information that Phillips presented, which is amazing. Uh, it was also looked at by Alistair McDonald of the Genealogical Studies Postgraduate Program at the University of Strathclyde. That's also Phillips uh, University. Um, it was actually funded by an in a private donor. And Al I've been nagging Alistair to share the information with us. Philip, if you could track him down and get him to write something up for us, it'd be great. Or if you could do that, it'd be great. But one thing that came out of that is that if you've noticed on the um, record I have for Malcolm Lord Forbes, he don't have a Y DNA test. So what we're going to do for the society is pay for that big Y DNA test from Malcolm Lord Forbes. I think, Philip, that'll make you very happy, I hope. So you can trace all those SNPs. The second part of our genealogy project is we want to recruit up to 10 male Forbeses with families who have resided in Aberdeenshire for at least 300 years. Alex, I'm looking at you. Uh, I was hoping to start promoting these uh, family tree name kits this summer uh, when we visited with our tour. But what I wanna do is I may visit this summer myself and go to the Lanark Highland Games and talk to people individually. I found that you just can't promote it. You have to talk to people. I also am a member of the Aberdeen 
and Northeast Scotland uh, Historical Association. I want to promote it with them. I would encourage you to all to uh, become a member of the Aberdeen Nor and Northeast Scotland Historical Association. I did a blog about them a while back. I also received the Aberdeen Voice. I want to promote it through them as well. If you have any other ideas on how to uh, recruit and promote the idea of getting Forbes's with families who reside in Aberdeenshire for the last 300 years, let me know. As you've heard from Philip and from Beth, he will continue to do the Y-DNA group analysis. Uh, it's harder when you don't have the Y-DNA, the male of the line. It's, it's, I know we've heard people who are frustrated about that, but we will try to follow through with that. We are also looking at additional initiatives. I'm going to work with Philip to see how we can get uh, FTD, oh, that's Family Tree DNA general funds available. What I did was basically back up. I went to all the other clans to see what they were doing on Family Tree DNA and what they're doing on the websites. And these are some of the ideas I got from them. They generally have general funds for people who can't afford to get the big Y DNA test. I want to make it available through Family Tree DNA, and they have a special accounting procedure for that. And then I also want to subsidize DNA tests for represent representatives of specific family lines, like you heard Alex talk about, uh, the Mani Musk line, of which he's a member of the the Nyao side there, I hope I said it right. Um, I also want to work with Family Tree DNA to get discounts for our members. Many of our clan uh, families have that as well. And then, as we've just discussed, research the DNA connections with forms of the spelling variations. Uh, the board has allocated a budget of $2,000 for the next year. Uh, we will be grateful for any donations uh, toward this project. But that's what we're going for at this point to help you all trace your genealogy and also get the DNA connection. So I covered a lot. Does anyone have any questions about the genealogy project? And then I'll get to some of the questions that have come up in the chat. Any questions? Yes, uh, I see Stephanie, hello. Go figure. Um, now I just have a question about um, the subsidy for the DNA, um, just a legal question, because we're going to get into some legal things here with Jeannie, or you know, with DNAs before long. Mm -hmm. um, who would own that DNA if you subsidized it? The person who did the test, but for example, if I go to Scott, I'm going to say, and we want you to join the Forbes, a, a requirement would be join the Forbes surname group therefore alex i mean I, I mean philip would have access to it beth would have access to it only that the administrators would have access to it unless you make it public well i guess i guess at this point because see technically i own my brother's dna because i've paid for it I, I own his dna analysis but i mean who would own it if you would would the person whose DNA was analyzed, would they own it or would you own it? Would Clan Forbes Society? Oh, oh. And again, that actually came up with another question we had with the last gathering. What are the require? What are the uh, terms of service, TOS, for uh, family tree DNA? We can research that so people have a more informed idea. However, okay. I would encourage that if the Clan Society paid money to get a test, we would request certain requirements, that being that you join the Forbes surname group and that our administrators have access to it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fair enough. That's good. So that's that's what I'm thinking at this point. Uh, but the point is we don't want anyone not to be a part of the DNA group if they can't afford it. And I want to get discounts. I notice that other clans have discounts. It's like, I'm Scottish, I want some of them. So I want to look into that as well. But the big chunk, the easy chunk is I have permission from Malcolm to get the uh, big Y700 uh, test done for him. Uh, again, we're very fortunate to have a clan chief who is so engaged and involved and supportive of the entire clan. Uh, we all should be very grateful for that. Um, but the big thing will be to get the 10 kits from each of the branches that 
Alex mentioned, uh, so we can connect to a branch and then, you know, with, with best scale and getting documentation, connect with, with Phillips scale and, and identifying the DNA, getting the connections, with best scale of connecting up the uh, individual genealogy to the DNA. With all of our engagement, we can help people with their genealogy. I, I've asked, been asked so many times, can you help me find this person to get my genealogy? No. <laughs> Um, but I can provide you the tools and the resources to help you, or you can go uh, to uh, the Association of Professional Genealogists, APG, and you can hire someone with a background in Scottish genealogy. So we can't be involved with that, but if we subsidize, then I would requ we would sure surely request they make that available. Any other questions for anybody? Just jump out or wave your hand and I'll get to the questions in the chat. Nope, you'll be hearing, hearing more about that. Uh, let me get to the questions in the chat. You mentioned, let's see, uh, Margaret, you mentioned Forbes Town in California. I think that's a great article for you to research. Margaret, you're on mute, you're smiling. Margaret, you're still on mute. There you go. Um, there is a Forbes town and it dates back to Jared Forbes, who was my great, great, great grandfather. He came from Philadelphia. So I didn't really realize about the Forbes in Philadelphia. His whole family came out there, quite a few Forbes out there. Um, it's kind of a ghost town now, but they used to have a Forbes museum there. And I think that would be a wonderful article that you could write for us. <laughs> I'll look into, not much there now, um, for a while there was, a little museum, and but mostly just the local history. They ran some stagecoach lines and hotels, but they are descended from the Forbes that I guess started in Pennsylvania, but they mm -hmm. go back to the James Forbes. I said, I'm confused about Captain James. Right. Do what you can, get your research together and I can work with you on that. Okay. Uh, I had a question, or uh, Stephanie, yes, this, the uh, Forbes branch chart is on the website, and I'll feature that uh, with the follow-up from this as well. Um, we talked about the directory that Stephanie worked on, and it's in the archives of the member site of the website, so take a look at that. Uh, when... Question from Chris, so when you are in Ancestry, how do we link our research to Forbes? That's a tricky question um, because for two reasons. One, what is your documentation? So we can link it, Chris, if you're still on, I can't see you. Um, because we want the clan Forbes, House of Forbes to be the definitive uh, connection. Also, secondly, we use it as a fundraiser. We have something called the House of Forbes membership. And one of the advantages of becoming a House of Forbes member is we promise you that we will link your documented ancestry to the House of Forbes. What I'm finding is that a lot of people just look for a William Forbes, for example, born around between you know, 1650 and 1660, find one that they like, add it to their tree, bingo zingo, they have an ancestor. Beth, can you react to that as working with DAR? That's not really how it works, is it? Exactly. <laughs> what are the challenges you have with, with DAR? Well, it, it, on a monthly basis, uh, DAR patriots, um, as they call the, their gateway ancestor, is um, the new the new proof documents that are found every day proves and unproves previously documented lines on a regular basis. So someone might have joined 100 years ago, they would not be able to join today, Shoot potentially. And um, that, that's a moving target. Uh -huh. And, and it, so it gets, um, gets very confusing for people. What kind of documentation do you accept for determining lineage? I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. What kind of documentation do you accept for lineage? I, I went through the DAR. I had a uh, ancestor 
who did um, fight in the Revolutionary War. And in fact, that's how my family got to upstate New York. He got a pension and a grant, land grant. Mm -hmm. But I'm having difficulty making the connection in terms of birth documents. Mm -hmm. So what documentation do you require to prove lineage? Well, uh, there's there are 200 <laughs> societies. A DAR is one of them. Um, every society has a, a different um, different standard of what they will accept as proof. Some of the old world societies will only accept the uh, Gary Boyd uh, Roberts and um, uh, Douglas Richardson works for Gateway Ancestors. DAR has been more open to accepting different forms of proof so that you can prove new patriots to DAR. Um, but some of the older societies will only accept certain proof documents. So you're either in there or you're not until something new is proven. Um, and that's kind of the, the two different types of societies that are uh, available for ant entry now. So to get back to Chris's question, it's a question of how can we document that before we link it? And I know a lot of people have been added to Ancestry.com, Clan Forbes tree, but we may have to go back in it's to really ascertain it. We had, like, for example, as mentioned by Margaret, the two captains. Well, which one should go in the tree? Where are they located? So it's really a documentation issue. And that's something that we would need help from, from people who want to volunteer for that. Um, I know DIR is far, for example, far more stringent than SAR, the Sons of American Revolution. Um, and I know that with, when I was president of the uh, San Angel Society of Washington, D.C., we just accepted, accepted someone's word. Here's my list. Okay, fine, you're in. So we're not quite sure. It's, it's challenging at this point. But if, to get your lineage on the Clan Forbes tree, you'd have to submit a documentation, the application for For Clan Forbes membership, submit your fee, and then we would then use that to check your connections. <coughs> That's the best I can answer for that. Um, next question, which is the true story of the crest? The crest is simply what the Lord Lion has approved for the coat of arms for Lord Forbes. Um, that's a very simple answer. Uh, the Lord, uh, the crest has, can you still see me? Yep. Okay, my, my monitor seems to have gone out. The crest is the, the top part of the uh, coat of arms and that is what appears on the coat of arms for Clan Forbes, that is the crest. That was my question. I mean the three, is it bears? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I yes. Two it's different a... stories about where that came from. I wondered if there was one story that was told to be true that I can pass on. <laughs> a story that was told to be true. Yeah, like that'll happen. Um, is Alex still on? I just lost my monitor, so I can't really see. Yeah, I'm here. Could you talk about on a, on a car, how do you say his name? On a car. Oh, Yes, could you explain about the, uh, the killer of bears? Yes, the um, family, family legend is that the first Forbes was uh, an Irish prince called O'Connor. Spelt very wrong. Yes. Um, <laughs> who um, won the estate of Forbes um, because it was made uninhabitable by, because it was occupied by an enormous bear um, which uh, had a particular preference for maidens, <laughs> for reasons we don't understand. Um, and he basically um, uh, killed it with the sword that hangs over the fireplace at, at Castle Forbes, according to legend, um, and uh, thus secured the land. Um, and the, the three bears' heads are in memory of that achievement. Um, I don't believe a word of that, but... Uh, <laughs> They have always been the. Sorry, I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, somewhat skeptical about about the mythical um, traditions, but I, I thoroughly enjoy them, and, and and they very often have a. They they certainly influence what some people did because they believed them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the exactly those arms have always been the arms of Lord Forbes, 
Um, the earliest record of them is in about 1430, I think, in one of the, the heraldic rolls. And there's no reason to think that they weren't um, in use by the Forbeses for many years before that. It has always struck me, though, um, the similarity, the, the very close similarity between the arms of the Forbeses and the Gordons. Um, and I am very suspicious about the whole thing. Um, because they both they both have the same crest or similar crests, a, a stag's head. They both have the same supporters to their arms, which is greyhounds or, or uh, hunting dogs. Um, and whereas the Gordons have three boar's heads um, uh, erased, which means ripped off, so the bottom bottom of the the animals' heads are, are rather bloody. Uh, the Forbeses have three bears, three muzzled bears' heads. Um, cooped, which means cut off, as with an axe or a sword, um, a nice clean cut. Um, the muzzling of the bear, I mean, the, the muzzled bear is obviously a, a circus animal rather than a wild animal, uh, but it may also have some reference to um, uh, a triumph over the, 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 the British inhabitants of, of, of Britain before the, the um, Celts and the Picts arrived. Um, because Arthur is a, is a uh, sorry, the bear is is a an ancient symbol of um, of the British race, uh, and and uh, the name Arthur, as in King Arthur, um, uh, in 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 the um, ancient British language means a bear, which is why it's very telling that one of the most common names in the Forbes family was Arthur. Um, it's a very unusual name in Scotland, except among the Forbeses and in fact the Campbells. Um, and it does directly refer to the coat of arms. We've had enough yet, or can I, I can go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, if you've been to Castle Forbes, you know, right below the claymore that apparently slew the bear uh, is the bear stone, uh, which was found in the Nine Maidens Well area. Alex, could you explain that? Uh, yes, the, the, the Nine Maidens Well, which is. Um, uh, my reference to the bear liking maidens is actually a reference to the nine maidens as well. Um, there was just, uh, a saint um, called St. Palladius, I think, who, who um, had nine, nine daughters who were all killed, I think, by Roman soldiers, and they all became saints. Um, and there are several nine maidens wells, one at um, uh, near Castle Forbes and one near Pitsligo, in fact, by coincidence. Um, and the, um, the, the bear's stone, which is believed to be um, uh, more than a thousand years old, um, was moved from uh, where it was by but near this well, just in the middle of a wood, um, and, and placed in a, a place of honour, really, above the fireplace <clears throat> in the hall in, um, in Castle Forbes, Newcastle Forbes. Um, the only thing I would mention is, is that, first of all, in, in the old accounts um, of the origins of the Forbeses, of which I think Boethius is, is the, the oldest, in writing about 1520. They talk about it being a wild boar. And this stone uh, in, in the 18th century description, I think it's in the, in the House of Forbes, the 18th century description of the stone describes the, 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 mar the marks of its tusks can still be seen on it. Um, well, bears don't have tusks, but boars do. Um, there's a lot of confusion in, in this um, uh, in these in these um, early symbols um, in, in the heraldry. Um, and I do I do wonder whether there is some, uh, whether the Forbes' heraldry originally was a version of the Gordon herald, heraldry and, and they, they um, adopted it in some way. Um, nah, I don't, know. I don't think so. They're late bloomers. <laughs> they came from France. They were lowlanders. They came up north <laughs> after we were well settled. Come on, Alex. Come on, get on your Forbes pride. <laughs> yeah, um. okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been like an hour and a half. This has been amazing. Uh, I, I, I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Alex and Philip, particularly uh, signing in from Scotland at, with the, the wrong time that I gave them. Um, so especially appreciate their jumping in. Does anyone have any other question to wrap up uh, or a comment to wrap up. Oh, we have, I have to exit. Okay. Um, again, I will provide all the information to you. Any other general question before we wrap up and we can all go to bed if you have to. <laughs> no? 
Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's very interesting, and it looks like uh, a lot of things are being done, and uh, very exciting. Thank you very much. Oh, one more project I have to mention. Jim knows about this. I'm particularly excited about it. Um, maintaining Scottish heritage really requires the next generation. And a project we're now working on with a young Scottish digital artist in Scotland is creating a Clan Forbes coloring book for kids. Wow. Is hey. that not cool? That <laughs> is. That is. You'll be hearing more about it in the next couple of months. Um, but Ron Pearson's daughter, who is a uh, education uh, specialist, is working with us on it, along with her two kids, a 10-year-old and 12-year-old. We have a Scottish artist who was working on getting these photographs outlined into coloring books. And we're going to do the little paragraphs on each. So this is the type of thing that the Clan Forbes Society is working for on your behalf. I encourage all of you to figure out what you can bring to the society, how you can help, how you can move it forward. We are a volunteer organization. Our budget is $5,000 for the next year. Uh, that's why we depend on volunteer support. So look at what we do on the website. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, see what you would like to do. We would love to have you as part of the Team Forbes. And for, with that, I would like to thank you all for participating. And I wish you all grace me guide. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Well done. Bye-bye.